I'd like to spend just a few minutes talking about uh, small businesses as the backbone of the American economy and actually talking about some trends that I'm seeing when it comes to small businesses. And I think they're going to be very relevant when you see this excellent data that we're about to hear in this session today. So there are three trends that I would like to talk about when it comes to the small business economy. Because when you think about this, this is the backbone of the U.S. economy. Over half of America's workers either own or work for a small company. So there are about 28 million small businesses uh, out there according to the SBA's definition of a small business. So there's at least one owner, and that would be 28 million people right there in a small business. And then on top of that, they are also employing people in their businesses, anywhere up to 500 people in their businesses. So that's a lot of workers in the U.S. economy. Small businesses generate two out of every three jobs today, and that's pretty important when jobs are scarce and a lot of people are looking for work. And they just greatly add to our GDP and overall economic activity in the country. Small businesses are everything from the farmers uh, to uh, someone running a uh, body shop, car body shop, to someone who is in some kind of a medical practice, such as a dentist or a physician. I'm in Florida this week. I'm actually talking with you from Orlando where I'm attending a conference. And I drove up from southwestern Florida through the central part of Florida. I think you're going to hear today that uh, there's a lot of um, good small business activity taking place in cities in Florida. And I found that really interesting. You know, but it's not just the cities. I mean, we focus on the cities, and you're going to hear why these cities are so good today for small businesses. But remember also there's a lot of rural and suburban area out there where small businesses are thriving. And as I drove through rural Florida, I saw just field after field after field of citrus groves and then alternating with cattle ranches. And I never realized how many cattle ranches there were in Florida. And these are all small, independently owned ranches. Uh, and the citrus groves are all small, independently owned citrus groves as well. So the next time you're drinking your morning orange juice, think that that you know, came from a small citrus grove, probably a family run or a small business operation somewhere in Florida uh, who somehow managed to get those oranges picked off the tree, put in a truck, taken to a center where it becomes uh, turned into orange juice or it ends up in your uh, grocery store. Uh, and those are small businesses that have a hand in that. So everywhere you look, everywhere you touch, you are seeing small businesses. Now I'd like to talk about the three trends I mentioned. And uh, briefly, the first one is we're seeing this race to mobile has just accelerated in 2015. We've been hearing about mobile, mobile, mobile for years now, actually. Well, it is now here. We have reached the point where there are more mobile devices and more people accessing the web through mobile devices, either smartphones or tablets of some kind, than actually using desktop computers. And on top of that, we're seeing the pace of that increase dramatically to the point that Google even recently came out and made a pronouncement that said, hey, if your website is not mobile friendly, you may not appear in the mobile search results. So your business may not even be there. You may become invisible uh, in the worst case to people who are using these mobile devices to find businesses to frequent when they want to buy something or um, check something out. So it's become just imperative that small businesses be involved in mobile. And uh, you know, I think that ties in with technology, which is our next trend, how automation has become the buzzword for small businesses. And a lot of this is cloud-based automation. So we're talking about 
uh, automation that's in the form of software that small businesses access by going online to the cloud. And they're getting this, this information. Um, you see uh, these cloud apps that have uh, proliferated. I mean, it's not any more a question of, gee, can I find something to help me in my business? It's a case of there's so many options out there. Which one do I choose? And that has become the good and the bad problem for small businesses. It's that there are plenty of options out there. Now it's the question of finding the right one, implementing the right technology solution. And for that, you really need skilled people, and you need really the money to do the implementation. And that brings us to our third trend, which is about getting funding. And this plays in very, very well with biz to credit In fact, biz to credit is one of the leaders of this trend. And the trend is that in some ways it's become easier for small businesses to get funding, although in other ways there are just as many problems as ever and just as many obstacles, and maybe in some ways there are more obstacles. There are just different kinds of obstacles than in the past. And what I mean by that is that small businesses have now the option to go online to platforms like is to credit and apply for funding to multiple lenders in one place at one time and get assistance from knowledgeable uh, support people who can direct them to the right options, the right kind of lenders for their situation. And that is great. That is a wonderful positive. And that is what I mean by it being easier than ever and by a company like biz to credit being a leader in this. The ways that it's harder, and I think you're going to hear this is, or at least just as hard, let's put it that way, is that um, lack of credit history, low um, uh, credit scores, uh, as well as lack of information about how to best present your business still proliferate for small businesses. The businesses who figured out the technology, who figured out the mobile, and who uh, work at getting funding are some of the most successful businesses out there. And I think you're going to see that reflected in the data that we're going to hear from Rohit Aurora. And so with that, I would like to turn it over to Rohit uh, for presentation of the top cities for small businesses in America. Rohit? Yeah, Anita, uh, thanks for bringing up all those points. and. Uh, and I think, yeah, this is a great time for, uh, I would say, small businesses in this country. Uh, and I would say there are three reasons. One, obviously, is, you know, we are finally out of the grip of uh, the Great Re Recession. And as, as it is said, you know, there is now uh, light uh, you can see in the tunnel, and that is not the incoming train anymore. So I think uh, that is something uh, very important. I think the other thing which is also happening now is that, you know, we are also seeing that you know the gas prices have uh, hit a historical low over last uh, year and this is the first summer after 6 years when the gas prices are, are are very low so that clearly means that you know we are able to uh, you know uh, will be seeing lot more money in hands of uh, consumers who will be spending at the at their business local businesses so what we are doing at best to credit is for last 3 years uh, we are, you know, uh, looking at uh, the data for the growth of uh, metropolitan areas and cities. And what we have found out is that, you know, uh, the numbers have changed quite a bit, uh, but there are certain themes, you know, to it. So, uh, and I think that is something, you know, very, very important uh, uh, that, you know, we have looked at their, you know, growth by their annual, annual revenue, by the credit scores. By the age of business, obviously, the, if there's more longevity, it means that you know the businesses in that area are, are doing well. While at the same point of time, if more more businesses are also opening up in certain areas, that also means there's more economic activity. So that's something very interesting. Like Anita is in Orlando today, mm -hmm. and we are seeing Orlando is actually seeing a lot of startups, uh, and there are a few reasons behind it. One obviously is that you know they uh, the 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 economy in Florida has improved. The the cost effectiveness of starting a business in 
uh, in uh, Orlando or in Florida is there, uh, you know, and also the other thing we are seeing is that, you know, the Central Florida University in that area actually is becoming a big incubation center. So, so while Orlando is the leader in the startup businesses, in the overall ranking, uh, you know, very surprising city came uh, is uh, uh, Riverside, California. So, and, you know, people haven't really heard about it and people, you know, when they saw rankings, they said, how, how come Riverside, where is Riverside? We don't know. And, and it's very interesting that, uh, you know, over last, uh, two three years it started the trend and this year it has become more is that you know a lot of immigrants have moved into those areas a lot of you know businesses from the LA area greater LA area have moved into those places and we are seeing you know it is becoming a hub of uh, you know IT a lot of IT services food processing obviously uh, is there uh, because of you know uh, California being the food basket of the country uh, a lot of uh, you know health uh, medical professional professional services businesses are growing there and uh, and also you know uh, what we are seeing is there's a lot of support locally right now in that area and especially the economy in California has improved and the local economic development uh, 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 centers and, and all the are buzzing with activity we, we are also seeing something which is very interesting is a lot of money coming in uh, from other countries like China especially in the EB5 pro program there which is uh, the immigrant visa program, which you know, a lot of that money is coming in to buy or start new businesses, and that is actually growing that economy uh, or the regional economy really well. So, in spite of having high taxation, you know, reverse side the good news is the cost of doing business is low compared to LA or San Fran, while the the technology boom in California is helping reverse side quite a bit, and then the other trends, including more immigrants and more money coming in, is also helping uh, it. So. John, if you can just do the next slide. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, last year San Jose was, uh, you know, number one. This year it has dropped pretty dramatically. So what it's also showing is that, you know, uh, no, there is no guarantee of a city or a metropolitan area will retain their competitiveness if they don't take constant steps, you know, towards that. And San Diego, one, one big reason has been is that, you know, the cost of doing business has just shot up because of the technology boom, you know, we are seeing that the cost of doing business was pretty high in San Fran earlier, but, you know, that is just, you know, uh, got um, even uh, more expensive in San Diego. And actually San Fran is, is higher than San Diego because the other factors of opportunity and overall growth is actually in San Fran is now better than San Diego. Uh, again, you know, if you see here, there are some very clear trends, you know, excess uh, overall is doing pretty well. Uh, you know, New York uh, metropolitan area is again growing. So in spite of high cost, you know, because of the tech boom, because of the, you know, boom in the tourism industry, healthcare, New York Metro has staged a pretty good comeback this year. It has become more competitive. Uh, you know, Chicago is actually doing very well. And there's a very clear reason where uh, Chicago is a transportation and logistics hub in this country. And because of lower gas prices, um, uh, and also more uh, oil being shipped through the uh, ra railroads uh, and transportation and logistics uh, industry is booming. Chicago is booming because of that. IT services, auto component uh, industry in that area from Detroit to the Chicago Belt has actually you know helped Chicago to really you know get uh, ahead. And then the cost of doing business is lower in Chicago than any of the other big cities in the country. So that has also helped Chicago to come back in the marketplace in, in a very strong way. And then, well, you what's know, going on in Charlotte? Charlotte yeah. is a, a smaller city that's way up top. Yeah, so Charlotte is actually very interesting because what's happening in Charlotte is that, you know, Charlotte was all, always a financial services hub, and over the last two, two years it has also becoming a big IT hub. You know, there's a lot of IT companies coming up, a lot of uh, uh, outsourcing, uh, onshore outsourcing is happening. In Charlotte because there's a very good skill set uh, uh, labor pool is there you know a lot of good universities low cost of doing business again good weather uh, so Charlotte has really climbed because of that and you know as financial services become more te tech driven you know that's what driving a lot of that growth in the Charlotte area uh, and and I think what the local government has done also is the Economic Development Council has also you know over the last few years have given a lot of grants and a lot of other facilities to local businesses uh, which have already grown. So obviously you know, that has helped uh, and 
uh, again, you know, going back to Riverside, I would say it's a it's a prime example of you know that uh, if if this if the city regulators and the local businesses join hands, which actually has happened a lot in Riverside, even their regional development centers have been very aggressive going into even countries like China and getting a lot of investments under EB5, and that has resulted in a lot of new businesses opening up, a lot of local businesses getting a lot of equity injection into their businesses. Uh, uh, so that has been very interesting uh, development. Not many people realize that you know that the, it's not just the immigrants who are driving up the business, but the immigrant money is actually driving small businesses in those space, creating more jobs, and also you know this whole shop riverside campaign, uh, you know which the local government did with uh, the local businesses this year has actually boosted a lot of you know local businesses. Chicago again coming back, you know a lot of. Uh, you know, logistics businesses, a lot of movement of cheap oil has helped uh, the economy there. Uh, and also, you know, again, the technology sector has become very robust. You know, there has been more inland uh, migration of immigrants from coastal areas, which has again helped Chicago. And Chicago is literally the gateway to, uh, to Midwest. So as manufacturing has come back uh, into U.S., you know, Chicago has benefited a lot. And New York is interesting. Well, New York, I would say, Mayor, Bloom, Mayor Bloomberg did a lot of work in New York over the last three, four years to make the city safer. You know, he brought in Cornell uh, University in the city, so that is already helping from a technology hub. You know, in New York has become the second largest technology hub in the country after uh, uh, San Fran area. There's a lot of new money coming in. Um, uh, the tourism business is doing very well. I think the issue still is very high taxes, very high rents, and actually rents are going up pretty dramatically in New York right now uh, because so much of global money is coming in. And then I think the the overall uh, uh, the new regime in New York City is not helping uh, the businesses that much, you know, from a cost perspective. Orlando is very interesting, you know, as Anita was saying, you know, she's seeing so many new businesses. Orlando has the youngest businesses, and and I think uh, the lot of uh, young immigrants going uh, even inland immigration is happening so to today you know like uh, this year uh, late last year actually florida became florida has more uh, people under the age of 25 than uh, state of new york so which is pretty surprising cost of real estate is very low compared to new york san fran other uh, cities very low state tax weather is nice and as uh, the as the technology spreads more and more into mainstream businesses you know that is helping florida a lot you know the central florida university is a prime example of their incubation center doing really well uh, san jose you know pretty much booming but you know it is becoming very expensive you know the te taxation has gone up the overall cost have gone up the rents have gone up the wages have gone up so i think we are starting to see that issue you know philadelphia is very interesting again because you know it's getting benefited because of uh, gas, uh, low gas, shale gas stuff in the, in uh, not in Philly area, but in areas close to Philly, uh, you know, there's a lot of rejuvenation and revitalization of uh, downtown Philly. A lot of small business activities happening in and around Philly, and that is actually you know coming and becoming very good. And San Diego is is actually very interesting again because San Diego is in south, uh, less costly, less expensive than uh, some of the northern cities in California. But technology center, a lot of outsourcing, uh, in inland outsourcing is happening there. Then uh, a lot of food processing uh, pieces there. So I think San Diego is getting uh, becoming very competitive city from a growth perspective. And there's a lot of opportunity for small businesses right now in that whole area around LA, whether it's the Riverside on the north or or San Diego in the south. So California, we're starting to see more growth there. Uh, I think. Uh, what we are doing at Biz to Credit, and I think this problem still continues, as Anita said, you know, small business growth is coming back. The optimism, optimism is coming back. There is a recent Wells Fargo survey which said that, you know, the small business optimism is highest in the last six years. But the still the access to credit is still very tight. You know, our small business lending index uh, at Biz to Credit, you know, we are seeing uh, the highest number of uh, approvals from big banks in the last five years, but still that number at 21.4 percent is still um, almost little more than half of what it was prior to the great recession uh, so that is still there you know the access to credit has opened up but still the cost of money is higher uh, for small businesses compared to any other uh, set of uh, 
i would say assets in the country even consumer lending is is right now cheaper than small business lending which is ironic because consumer lending is more is more unsecure than small business lending so i think that is still a big challenge banks still haven't gone online as anita was saying you know everybody is moving on mobile while banks n- n- none of the banks in this country even today have a online digital application for small businesses so so they are still so behind the curve and while alternative lending has boomed uh, because uh, you know they have adopted the technology they have adopted the online platforms a lot of alternative lending is still very expensive and very short term and as businesses grow they need more long term money for capital improvement for buying equipment for buying real estate and i think that's where you know business credit is playing that role more and more and we are seeing more growth in the market today for more long term products uh, uh, and that's where you know what we are doing is that you know we have created this whole smart uh, application smart dashboards where customers can come and can apply for loans it's one single application uh, your credit doesn't get impacted and then you know you have the ability to go in and uh, get the right matches and also you know execute on those matches so so that clearly means that you know you are not being shopped around while you are shopping around all your lending options and then as a small business owner you can easily go in and uh, you know uh, choose any of those options and can get funded uh, business credit over last one year has also we have started and scaled up our institutional platform so that means that we have aggregated money from family offices credit funds uh, endowment funds and we are trying to provide that money in between 11 to 18% apr which is still higher than the bank money but much cheaper than alternative lending and there we are approving loans up to a million dollars uh, within 24 to 48 hours and uh, we are also launching a whole commercial re- real estate product where we will do up to 2 million dollars very soon uh, interest only payments so any business owners who are looking now to buy a piece of real estate or want to do capital improvement and want to grow their business i would say you know they can actually look at our institutional platform and borrow money and then we are helping them to refinance it with banks down the line so that's where we are in terms of you know access to credit it has improved but it still is uh, a tight market you know okay um very good so at this point uh i'd like to actually turn it over to john mooney uh, to talk about marketing your small business john would you um care to walk us through some pointers there Sure thing, Anita. Um, well, first of all, I uh, I always lead off by trying to explain to to people the differences between public relations and advertising, because uh, people say, well, I I want to advertise this event, and what they really mean is that they want their local newspaper to cover it. They want a story written about them, which is um, you know I use a, an old world example to try to explain the differences i know the newspaper industry is is sort of crumbling right now because of digital however most people are familiar with the format is where each section of the uh, newspaper has something different whether it's sports or business or entertainment or local news and when you read a story in the newspaper you can read an article or you might see an ad for the local car dealership in the lower right hand corner well it's the same principle uh, applies to everything so if you look at that page in the newspaper and if you're reading about the uh, you know the score of the Philadelphia Phillies game that information came from a reporter who got press releases about the uh, you know they got the box score who hit the home run who was the losing pitcher etc whereas the car ad came from the car dealership and it was placed and paid for um by the ad agency on behalf of the car ad so um there are a lot of similarities which is why people confuse them uh both are marketing tools you're elevating consumer interest in a product or service uh branding yourself establishing awareness in the marketplace uh providing information to the consumer about your brand about your company uh building awareness um using different media vehicles uh, including print um tv and and cable which um really is uh you know cable has really changed the industry over the years but now the internet and um sort of web-based platforms and if you look at what 
Netflix has done, or uh, HBO now has HBO to go, and you can watch HBO movies on your iPad whenever you want to watch them. There's the whole uh, way that people have, has uh, that people consume media has changed because of technology. Um, so uh, you know your marketing helps you increase sales, promote your ideas, or create a call to action where you might want someone to do something. I know many small businesses uh, use uh, cause marketing very, very effectively. Uh, in fact, I just saw, you know, a local pizza parlor near me um, donated some pies to the school, um, and they're selling them at a dollar a slice to raise money for the class trip for the school. Um, he's got his table out there. He's got signage. Um, there's, uh, they're giving away the, the menus as they're there, and you know this has been a week-long fundraiser, and the kids go home, and they've got the menus in the backpack, and he also has on the table a little app. It's a pizza app, and it has games and different ways that you can order your pizza online, and he's really hitting his core customer. Like, who's coming into a pizza shop at 2.30 in the afternoon? It's middle school kids. And they're all going to download this app and get it on their phone. And there's a thing where you can spin a prize wheel on the app and you can win a free slice of pizza. Very, very clever. He's out in the community. He took a photograph. Uh, he's going to send it to the local newspaper. Um, so he created a little bit of a call to action with this because for the next two days they're doing this fundraiser. And from what I understand, they've already raised enough money to send the kids on the class trip. Um, these marketing tasks, you know, PR, marketing, advertising, um, if you're a big company, you might handle it in-house. If you're a smaller company, um, yeah, I'm sorry, if you're a smaller company, you might do it in-house. If you're a bigger company, you're going to have a PR firm. You're going to have uh, you know, an ad agency, and you might even have them on staff too, where a P your PR expert in in house is interacting with your agency. Um, so what I find is that you know, if you do an effective public relations campaign, you can get the word out there, uh, get people talking about being excited about your brand, and not spend this kind of money that you do uh, in advertising for you know. E Think about how much money is spent on the Super Bowl and how many people who are watching the Super Bowl might not be interested in a certain uh, type of uh, company or industry. Um, now, the difference is uh, paid space versus uh, earned coverage. So when you place an ad, you pay for it, you know when it's going to air, um, how big it's going to be, if it's a broadcast spot, you know how, what the length is, etc. With public relations, you can send out information. Um, you know, the pizza guy could send out a photo, and maybe if there's turns out that um, there's a bigger story, like a fire or something else major happens, you know, his photograph of the kids buying the pizza won't get used. Um, so there's um, there's no guarantee that that you'll be covered in that media. Uh, creative control versus no control. Well, when you buy an ad, you're paying for what you say. You're talking about yourself. You you have total control of the message, what goes in the ad. Um, you know, if you if you think about what goes into a Coca-Cola or a Burger King or McDonald's ad, um, they have total control over that. With public relations, you can send them a press release and you know there's the uh, you know the best case scenario is that the reporter will write about your company in the way you've presented it in the release. Uh, and the worst case scenario is maybe that reporter has had a bad interaction with your company or someone they trust doesn't recommend you and then the story might not be positive. So with advertising you know that the wording and what said is going to be complimentary and with public relations you, you don't know, um, especially with, with product reviewers for instance. Uh, there's varying shelf life. There are ad campaigns that have gone on for years and years and years. For, uh, for those of you old enough to remember the old Norelco Christmas uh, commercials, it was a classic commercial with Santa Claus, and he was riding on a Norelco electric razor down a big hill, and it was a Christmas theme uh, ad that aired for decades. 
Um, with public relations, you submit a press release about the launch of a new product. You really get to do that about one time, unless you're Apple, uh, and then you know, then it seems like it's old news, unless you reach out to the media and get them to cover it uh, that day or in a short time period thereafter. Um, the one of the main differences, and and what you know, small businesses can know and take advantage of is if you're if you're going to advertise somewhere, um, you know, if you're a local restaurant and you're advertising Mother's Day specials, um, when someone reads the ad, you know you're being sold this product or service. You know that okay, here's the price fix menu for Mother's Day. You know what it's going to cost, and you're okay with that because you understand. It's an ad, um, but some people don't like ads. Um, and with public relations, if somebody reads an article that's written by somebody else, it carries a little bit more weight because you're not saying it about yourself. It's someone else is saying something about you. So biz to credit gets, uh, for instance, uh, covered quite often in some of the financial media, and the stories, you know, overwhelmingly are positive about the. Uh, ability to quickly uh, match borrowers and lenders and to get money into the hands of small business owners. Um, that is a story that comes out all the time and the kind of robust data and the understanding of what's going on in the marketplace that biz to credit has. Um, that is you know, so effective in building the confidence of people both on the borrower side to come in and register on biz2credit.com uh, to apply for a loan, but also on the lender side because the the people who at the end of the day are going to be loaning the two million dollars to buy a new um, you know to to buy a new building for a new location. Um, some tools. So, uh, looking at um, some of the ways the media has changed. You know, ten years ago, um, Twitter and Facebook. I, you know, Twitter just celebrated its anniversary. Facebook was fledgling at the time. Now they're very robust platforms. Uh, they incorporate all different types of media, um, prose, uh, you know, prose meaning text, um, video, photos. You can do all that stuff on social media. Uh, and it's very effective. Uh, if you post a video on Facebook, people are much more likely to click on that video. Uh, they're much more likely to pay attention to the brand. If you have something funny or engaging, there are a lot of cat videos out there. There are a lot of monkey and dog videos and fun and clever stuff that's going on. And marketers know this and, and small companies know this and some of them do it very well. The other thing about social media is the name really applies. It is social. Whereas a newspaper, the newspaper speaks to you. They write the story, but there's no feedback unless you were to sit down and write a letter to the editor. With social media, you're engaging in conversations and you're engaging your followers who, for the most part, will be your customers. Um, in fact, um, there's, a, um, there's a bar restaurant in New York City called Foley's Pub, and they're known as one of the top sports bars um, for baseball. And if a player comes in, because uh, they like to come in after the games, and sometimes they'll do a guest bartender for charity, uh, people will let each other know by social media, hey, so-and-so is going to be there tonight. Hey, let's go see them. And it builds the brand, it builds excitement, it, it helps the cause because they'll raise money and it brings in new customers. And the owner of, of Foley's believes, as long as I get people in the door once, I know they'll come back. The trick is to get them to come in. So we use a few uh, tricks like that for him. Um, there's also a link here if you want to see some of the things that, that he does. It's a very good example of a retail restaurant type of business that's very effectively losing social media. The other good thing about social media is you can create backlinks to your own website. So um, you could have a little story and you know Biz2Credit does this, it will have a story about um, you know things you can do to improve your credit score with a link to um, the Biz2Credit website where you can get these tips. So it's bringing in traffic to 
uh, to a particular website. And you know, since most people find out about new companies or things they didn't know about before via the internet, it's a very effective tool. Uh, LinkedIn can be uh, a very underutilized um, social media platform um, because a lot of people might think of it as, um, you know, hey, well, I'm not looking for a job, so why am I on LinkedIn? But it is very, very influential. And you can create groups and join groups within LinkedIn with like-minded people, with the people you want to connect with, potential partners. Um, those of you out there who who are on LinkedIn may have gotten updates. You know, congratulate Susie. She spent five years at this company, right? You can even celebrate for your own employees if you know that they're on LinkedIn. Hey, John is celebrating his 10th anniversary at this company this year. And then all his friends are going to see that. It gets pumped out through their network and people will click and like it. And you're building engagement about your brand and your employees. Um, you can be an active participant, you can monitor discussions, you can even promote your own blogs and your own idea pieces. Uh, very effective tool. Um, I mentioned about integration of photos and video. Um, not 73% of small business owners use YouTube in one way or the other and when they type things uh, you know they're looking for keywords. So um, that could be a whole other webinar presentation in itself of how to use keywords and how to market yourself via the internet that time just doesn't allow us to go in at, at this point. Um, lastly, I wanted to cover blogging. Some of you may have your own blogs already. Um, my advice is write about what you know. Stick to what you know. Um, that's where you have credibility. Be sure your blog ties back into it. Um, if you read some of the blogs on biz to credit for instance, they're usually enga engaging about small business finance. If you go on to Anita's site, which is smallbiztrends.com, the articles on that site are about small business, whether it's from a growth or marketing perspective, many different topics. Um, and what you can do in these blogs is present a problem and a solution. I need money, how do I get it? The solution might be you can't get money until you improve your credit score, you have a bad credit history. Here are three pieces of advice on how you can improve your credit score. So your blog can identify a need that other small businesses or customers might identify with and explain how your company can fill that need. You offer the product or service. Um, the second thing that's very important is to stay on a schedule. If you start blogging on a regular basis, people will know to ex expect it. Now how often depends on your own uh, time limitations, your own uh, things that are going on in your company. Um, you might try once a week, for instance, or every other Monday, something like that, and then get into a regular schedule. And people will know, oh, it's Monday, I can expect to see this blog. Or if you're doing it on a daily basis, they'll want to know what's new. If you can't do it for some reason, well, then you take a week off and you let your readers know and say, hey, um, we're gone fishing for the last week in August. Come back on September 1st, and we're going to tell you about uh, you know, what's going on in Taiwan right now or someplace you've gone on vacation. So. Um, Stick with what you know, publish on a regular schedule, and stick to it. Um, it's important if you're blogging to keep the blogs manageable. What happens is people are maybe experts on a certain topic, and they'll write a whole page, a thousand word essay on a particular topic. That can be very intimidating on the internet. Uh, if you don't break up into paragraphs, if you don't break up into shorter sentences, people will look at the screen and go, wow, this is a lot to read. There's a lot of content here. It's interesting, but I don't have 15 minutes to spend reading this topic right now. You're not going to read on the internet the kinds of stories that are in the New Yorker magazine. They're too long. They're too in-depth. Um, people want short paragraphs. I usually advise you know, five to six paragraphs where you present the, the topic. Um, three solutions and then you conclude it. And then your last paragraph is, here's how you can contact us. You know, John Mooney is an expert in small business growth public relations. Here's, my, you know, visit 
overthemoonpr.com. Um, if you're not a good writer, let's say you're good at fixing bicycles or hairstyling or nail salons or tattooing, uh, maybe someone else on your staff is good and they, they like a creative outlet. So you might be able to get some younger employee in your company who likes to do this kind of stuff, give them the opportunity. They become more valuable, makes them feel good, they become important, and they feel like they're growing with your company. Um, and that's fine. Or you could hire a freelance ghostwriter who writes your blogs for you if, if you're just not inclined but you want to, you, you know you have a story to, to, uh, to say. Each entry, each blog that you do adds another chapter in the continuing story of your small business. And when you create good content, it increases your SEO rankings, it keeps your name in front of potential customers, and obviously with the search engines, um, you know, that's how people are finding new businesses whenever they have a need. They don't go to the Yellow Pages anymore. Um, they pick up their phone most of the time. Um, I think biz to credit at least 60% of the people who visit the, the site are going there by mobile. Um, they're picking up their phone and going, okay, let's let's order a pizza. All right, here's the local guy. Boom, and they're doing it on the phone right there. So the higher you rank in, in Google search, if you Google local pizza, local Mexican delivery, the better it is for you. Um, with that, I'm going to throw it back to Anita. I'm sure she's going to have some questions for myself and Rowan, and, and maybe there are some questions also from the audience. Thank you, John, for those excellent points. That was very helpful and, and succinct. So yes, we do have quite a few questions. And um, I, I do want to encourage you that if you have questions uh, in the audience, please type them uh, into the chat box. And we'll try to get to as many as we have. I've already got about six or seven questions here. Uh, and several are for Rohit. So I'd like to jump in, Rohit. The first question is, how should small businesses interpret this best cities data? In other words, does it mean I have to relocate my company to one of these top 25 cities? What does it mean to me? Yeah, no, I think that's a very good question. So uh, my advice there is that if you already have a <clears throat> good business in, in a city which is not in top 25, you don't need to relocate there. But let's say if you're looking to expand your business, let's say you have a food franchise business and you're looking to expand your uh, location. So one of the guidance here is that, you know, you can actually expand it into a place where, uh, you know, you are seeing much more growth. Let's say you're, you're looking to sell your business and you are trying to move from one location to the other, then I think it's a great guidance for you that if, if you're looking to sell your business and want to buy a business or start a business, then this top 25 cities is actually a, a great guidance for you guys. Yeah. Uh, the other thing that we have seen over the years is that, you know, this is a very dynamic list. So uh, what is first or first five or 10 cities this year might not be among the top 10 cities next year. So one of our aims of bringing out more of these studies also is, and we are sending it to all, all the mayors of, uh, uh, of all the big cities in the country and also to the governors is that, you know, what are these cities doing better than others so that others can question that and learn and can, you know, uh, take advantage of it. So Riverside is a prime example where over the last two years, you know, we have seen a lot of economic activity and Riverside was not in top 25 in the first year, but then it started coming in and then climbing through the ranks. So I think what you can do is that you can also talk to your local economic development council, mayor, and take the study and go and show them and say that, you know, if some of the other cities are doing better, what they can do from a policy aspect, what they can do from a, uh, you know, creating a better environment for the businesses. And I think the local business councils can also learn from it and can make better use of it. So Riverside, again, an example where local business councils actually joined hands with <clears throat> with the local authorities and started, uh, you, you know, this whole initiative of buying local. And that actually helped, you know, their regional development center, a lot of support from uh, local uh, communities and residents to welcome uh, immigrant money into into their region, which actually propelled their small business growth. So I think those are the things that one can learn and one can take forward from there. Yeah. All right, great. That was um, that was helpful advice. Another question for Rohit: What 
kinds of businesses in what kinds of industries are doing the best today at getting financing successfully? So I, I interpret that to mean, Rohit, which are there any industries that um, are attractive to lenders more so than other industries? Yeah, no, I think that's a very good question. So, so today, you know, some of the industries like healthcare, IT services, uh, anything in the e-publishing business, uh, uh, anything in the e-retailing, uh, logistics and transportation, even construction in certain areas is getting more attractive for lenders because it's all uh, because construction has come back, uh, transportation and logistics has uh, boomed because of lower gas prices and more goods being moved because more people are buying things online. Uh, uh, and also, you know, obviously technology businesses are growing pre pretty quick. So if you're doing e-publishing, you are doing any uh, social media consulting, social media, helping other businesses to get better in social media. You know, all those businesses are growing, so which are non-traditional businesses. Obviously, the other big piece of business which actually has gained a lot over the last one and a half is, 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 is manufacturing, uh, which, you know, uh, nobody thought that will happen. but. Uh, there's a combination of reasons. One is obviously, you know, a lot of uh, uh, because of in the Midwest we have seen because of the auto boom, a lot of small and mid-size uh, auto component manufacturing and other support manufacturing has come back because of lower gas prices. Manufacturing has become very competitive. Uh, so a lot of uh, companies which have moved their manufacturing to China are, have come back, especially the bigger companies, and that has helped smaller companies to grow. Uh, so I think manufacturing is doing well. Healthcare, again, with the aging society, with a society which is living longer. Uh, so healthcare, we see a continuous uh, growth uh, in assisted living, uh, healthcare services. We are seeing a lot of growth in IT services. Uh, that's a no-brainer uh, because everybody is trying to go online and everybody is trying to do things online. So, so big growth, big demand there right now. Uh, and I, mm, so I think those are some very interesting sectors which normally were not doing well uh, in the last few years that we are seeing some strong growth. Uh, coming back, even gas station businesses, you know, are doing a lot better than earlier. So, so those are some of the sectors where lenders are more keen to lend money today. Okay, thank you. We have a marketing question next for John Mooney. Uh, John, you mentioned that with public relations, there is no guarantee that your news or your business will be covered. How do you increase your chances of getting your news covered? Are there a few things you can do to make your pitch sexier or more interesting to journalists? Well, one thing I think that people should know is think about the picture. Um, I have a good friend who uh, runs the uh, Fox station in Philadelphia. And uh, he told me when he first got in the business, think about the picture. Television is a visual medium. Right? You've got audio and video. Um, that's really a message that resonates even more now as people tend to consume their news on handheld devices and on iPads and or on a laptop. So if you're if you're doing some sort of event with your small business, having a picture to share that will be interesting, that will have interesting people in it is one way to help increase your chances. Um, so the photograph today of the kids lined up all the way around the length of the middle school trying to get their dollar slice of pizza is an interesting photo. If you have a local celebrity who's going to appear at your small business, if you're doing, you know, if it, you're an auto dealer and you've hired one of the um, American Idol casts off, casts off, cast offs to um, to shake hands or maybe perform a song at your auto dealership. That's going to get some increased attention because people say, "Hey, I can go meet this person." Um, there are, you know, some companies are very clever about um, coming up with newsworthy information taking advantage of some trends in the marketplace. For instance, if your, uh, you know, Memorial Day is coming up at the end of this month, we know that the media is going to cover things related to the military and veterans. So if you own a local restaurant, why not host 
a luncheon for uh, wounded uh, veterans who live in the area. And that's the kind of thing that the media might come and, uh, and cover. Um, you know, sometimes these, these types of events require a little bit of, of an investment of money. Right? You can't always just do the same thing over and over. Sometimes you have to spend a little bit. So if you're going to host this free luncheon for up to 25 veterans, you know that's going to cost you and your staff and your food costs, etc. But you're also building goodwill with the community. You're going to get 25 new customers from those people that you've given a free meal. If you've recorded it some way on a GoPro or on a phone or some type of video, you can post it on your own website and on Facebook and in Twitter and on YouTube and then it can go viral and you can share it with other people. So there are some things that you can do. One is understanding how journalists and the media work as far as timing and, and stories that are always going to happen, Valentine's Day, Mother's Day, uh, last day of school, 4th of July, some things that are upcoming. Uh, and then if you have if you have interesting information, if you have uh, data, you know the Biz2Credit example, if you have data that uh, about small businesses that nobody else has, not even the Federal Reserve, we share that data with Biz2Credit and then people um, view the company as an expert. So if you're an expert or something, you want to share your expertise and, and tell the audience something interesting. Uh, something they didn't know before. Oh, very good. And I think there are two, two, two very good questions there. You know, somebody asked, "What are your thoughts about merchant cash advance financing?" So, uh, my answer to that question is that you know, merchant cash advance as a product, you know, needs to be handled and tackled very carefully. Uh, you have to figure out, you know, how much it's going to cost you eventually, because if you're paying it back on a daily basis, it can be very expensive. We at BizToCredit have an institutional platform where we have replaced the merchant cash advance product with more longer term products, more payment options like weekly, bi-weekly, monthly. So if you are really you know, need, in need of some very quick money and you don't have any other option, then I would say go for merchant cash advance. But, uh, but otherwise, you know, the more you avoid it, better. The other question was, does BizToCredit find loans for startups? So I would say yes, a big yes. You know, last week uh, during the National Small Business Week, we launched a, a CDFI platform with Citibank and U.S. Treasury. Uh, so we started it, it in uh, Washington, D.C. area, and the URL is dcsmallbizloans.com. Uh, so you guys can check it out, and then we'll be rolling it out across the country. That's basically for startups because the CDFIs are community, community development financial institutions, which actually... Um, get money from US Treasury to give it to uh, startups or to businesses which don't have uh, a lot of credit history in the country. Uh, so I think that is mm, a very important uh, development where we now are, we are using our technology and our data to help more businesses to get loans across their life cycle. And I believe that's all the time that we will have because we're down to about the last uh, minute and a half. So with that, I would like to thank Rohit Aurora, the CEO of biz2credit.com. And um, that's the URL, correct, Rohit? Yes. Biz2credit.com. And uh, when you go to the site, there are also phone numbers that you can call. Uh, if you'd like to give the phone number, Rohit. Yeah. So you can call at... Uh, 800-200-5678, it's a very easy number, 800-200-5678, or you can just send an email at info at biz2credit.com and uh, we respond back to every email uh, that you send. So we look forward and then we'll also be sharing the recording of this webinar uh, with all the registered users and then if you have any other follow-up questions, if you write on info at biz2credit.com, we will be... Uh, will be pleased and keen to answer all your questions. All right, very good. And uh, John Mooney, thank you very much for sharing your marketing and PR expertise. And where can people learn more about you? Uh, www.overthemoonpr.com. And you also do fine work for Biz2Credit. So. Thank you. <laughs>